All right. So this will be a little different than most of the talks you've seen. It will involve a lot of live coding and code overviews and very primitive slides, but I think it'll be lots of fun. This is Jack. He's my oldest. I have four kids. And I come from a very small town in East Texas. There's no programmers. And for years, I've been trying to find ways to get more kids into programming because there's a, there's a big demand for, for experienced programmers in the world. And this talk will be about some of my recent experiments. So for this talk, so on the flight here in the hotel Saturday, let's see, we uh, designed and implemented a virtual machine and assembly syntax and assembler, wrote some drivers for some various I squared C hardware devices. Last week I'd done a graph file system using Git objects. Lots of stuff. Only about half the features actually made it to the demo, but that's how demos go. The goal here is to find a programming environment that is easy to get started with. When I was a kid, we had these things called the Commodore 64. The computer had 64 kilobytes of RAM. This has about 40 kilobytes of heap. However, the Commodore ran at about 0.7 megahertz. This runs at 160, so whatever. The RAM's not any better, but the CPU's a lot better, and they're cheaper too. These, these CPUs I'll be demoing are about $4 if you get them in bulk from China. These full dev kits are about $12 on Amazon. And they've got 32-bit core CPUs. They've got Wi-Fi built in. I think they're really good to tools for teaching kids programming via hands-on stuff. Now you may ask, what does this have to do with JavaScript? I will get to that. But first, Jack would like to write a program. There you go, Jack. Can you make a program that turns the light on and blinks at different colors? All right. Let's go. So one thing you'll notice about this language is there's no punctuation. As I found in my research, kids learning to type don't like looking up symbols. Or maybe you're programming on a mobile device like a tablet, and it's really hard to get to the punctuation symbols because they're hidden behind different tabs. And so what I did is I made a language. This is basically a Lisp language. Each keyword, such as mode here, has a fixed number of arguments. And the syntax highlighter here knows about those. And if he hits enter halfway through, it'll properly indent them. It'll tell you when you've had enough arguments. And it helps you in lots of ways. You can see it's, it was changing the colors as he was typing. And the idea is that we can write better tools instead of having more verbose languages, and maybe that will help kids. The other direction I was going is the, the graphical tools where you've seen Scratch and uh, Microsoft made a new one called Touch Develop. There's maybe a dozen of these nowadays where you drag and drop little blocks around. And those are fine and all, but I find the text interface is actually a lot uh, faster. There you go. Got it. So if anyone here has done Arduino programming, I implemented this on top of that. So mode is pin mode. So he's setting three pins on the device for output. The right command will set one pin to low. And pin eight is the ground on his LED. So he's just taking a regular data pin, pulling it to ground. And that'll be the, the common ground. And now he's going to write a loop that does something interesting. Forever is a fun keyword. Why do we need while true if most loops are going to run forever? Just add a new keyword forever. When you're making your own languages, you can do this. OK, you're doing the blink one first. That's good. Keep going. So write has two arguments. Six is the first one. Not takes one argument. And its argument is read, which takes one argument. So that entire thing is, and I actually learned this recently. On, on Arduinos, you can read from a digital pen, even though it's set for output, and it will tell you whether the pen is on or off. And so what he's doing is he's reading the current state of the pen, flipping it, and setting it back. So if it's on, it goes off. If it's off, it goes on. Now, this editor, this is, this is a web browser. This is Firefox. This is CodeMirror. I just wrote a custom mode and highlighter for CodeMirror. This is just regular off-the-shelf tools. And last night, I stayed up all night writing a compiler that compiles this down to bytecode much like we saw in, was it two talks ago? You ready? All right. So 
Yeah, click, click the button. Let me re reset it. It probably fell asleep when we were backstage. All right, wait for it to reconnect. This is the fun part of demos. So I have to get this text and JavaScript in a browser all the way down to assembly bytecode that runs on the interpreter on this hardware. There's a few steps between here and there. You show enough the code folding. He requested code folding when I was building this. So the back end is actually in, written in Lua using a project that I created a few years ago called Lovit. I took Node.js and re-implemented it in Lua because there's much lower overhead in the VM. The languages themselves are actually very similar. There we go, now the robots are connected. There you go. So he clicked the button. Can we see it? Yeah. Oh, that's pretty. Good job, Jack. You want to be done now? I'm staying Okay, you stay in there. All right. So who would like to dive into how this works and all these crazy languages involved? I think it's really exciting. Good job, Jack. That was his first live coding. So let's see. Six is what color? Six is green. Six is green. So you invert the green, wait half a second, and then five is blue. Yes. And then you invert the blue, wait half a second. And I'm seeing off green, cyan, and blue. So it's cycling between four colors. So the front end is actually pretty simple. It's just a regular in the browser IDE that's common these days. I worked for Cloud9 several years ago, and it seems like there's a hundred companies doing this nowadays, and Code Mirror makes it really easy. Nope, that's C code. This is my sloppy JavaScript I threw together, but Code Mirror, new mode, microscript assembly, sublime key bindings, you know, all that fun stuff. And we added a few buttons here. So let me let me show you some of the other robots I got here. So this one, this is called DanceBot. And it's also the most finicky. It doesn't like to work, but we will try. So I'm going to load the dance bot uh, code. So we've got good old go to. We've got some labels. We've got some variables. Any any keywords that have side effects or, or highlighted bright orange. And we've got other functions via go tos and go subs. It's a pretty primitive language, but it's actually real, it's actually a lot like WebAssembly. I, I've been following them, and it's. The assembly of this language is actually an abstract syntax tree, not a flat list of instructions like most assembly languages. And so this will probably make the robot jump off the table. Which one was it? The purple one? No, it's the top one. Top one? Let's see. Nope. It wasn't the top one. Dance spot. Purple one. And it's going to jump off. <laughs> Nothing fancy, just, you know, dancing robots. <laughs> so this one here, this took me way too long to wire up. So these, these LED matrix displays, they're actually just a whole bunch of LEDs arranged in a grid where you've got all the anodes across one side and all the cathodes across the other. And the way you light them is you do row by row, you ground one side, and then light all of the pins on the other, and it just scans through them a row at a time. This is why if you look at your alarm clock and you kind of shake your head or squint funny, you can see them shaking, because they're actually blinking really fast. And there's a chip here hidden under all this wire mess that's an I2C protocol, which is a bus protocol that only takes four wires. And so you speak a protocol to that, and you can tell it what pins to light up. And yeah, I wired it all by hand. But this is actually a driver for that protocol at the hardware level. Normally, these I2C drivers are in the Linux kernel or whatever operating system you're using. It's real simple. Use pins two and one for data and clock. Um, address 70 is the address of the device write to offset 21, that turns the oscillator on, write to address hex 81, that turns the blinking off, set the brightness to full brightness, so this is EO, which is brightness, plus F, which is full brightness, and that will turn the device on. So you just send these commands. So in, my, in my language, I made these primitives that makes building drivers really easy. 
And then, of course, we got the forever loop, where we count some variables, we decrement, and we set here the row and one 8-bit um, number for all the lights to light up. And let me run this one. Oh, and just for fun, I also play random sounds through the speaker. And of course, it's not working. That's OK. If you don't succeed first, try again. All right, they're connected. And that's the yellow one, right? There we go. So that's, that's the extent I got functioning for the demo. I had to sleep at least a couple hours this weekend. But I had much greater plans in store. I have a prototype for a way to share code. For those of you who know me, you'll know that a couple years ago I made a project called JS Git, where I re-implemented Git core in JavaScript because, well, it's JavaScript all the things, right? At least I thought it was a great idea. But I learned a lot about the Git core model. The, it's a, it's a graph. It's a directed graph with a content addressable data, which means the hash literally represents the data. And if you have the hash, you have the data as long as someone has you know, the key value store. But for all intents and purposes, the hash is the data. It's a really great compression scheme of, swarm, of sorts. It's, it's interesting to think about. But what I've realized is for teaching kids to code, you need a way to publish code. You need a way to reuse code. And so I'd actually designed this full system I prototyped it in a different VM that didn't finish. And I got all the semantics documented. But the basic idea is every file has a namespace, and the namespace maps one-to-one -to, -one to the file path within this global directory tree of files. The top-level tree is your username in the system, maybe a GitHub username or something. And then you can create arbitrary files underneath that. And if you want to use someone's library, you just import the path to some symbol deep within their tree, and the compiler will automatically, on the fly, download and cache any objects it needs, parse out the objects, and only include the code that you are using, so that what actually gets put on a microcontroller is very compact. These programs I was demoing, the binaries are about 120 bytes. I mean, you think JS1K is good. You should try assembly a tenth K? I don't know. It's pretty tight. But like I said, this thing only has 40K of RAM total to do work with. So you've got to get clever. Now, the connections are tricky. These devices do have Wi-Fi. And I even implemented a WebSocket server to run on the device, which was really cool, because then I could have a website using Cache Manifest, App Cache Manifest. The website works offline. You point it to a local IP address of your um, microcontroller, and it works completely without a server. So you can program hardware with a website and a Chromebook, and it works offline and locally. The only problem I had was the WebSocket server wasn't very reliable. And so the new plan, I made a Lovett server, because I do love it for my day job. And I've been, I've been really embracing coroutines. It's kind of like async await, except there's no keywords. It's implicit, which I think is easier. And it's, this is 100 lines of code. This web server handles talking to the robot via TCP. This handles talking to the browser. I got a bunch of middleware here. Um, handles the WebSocket from the browser. And all of that's in 100 lines of code. And so it's the bridge in between. The browser connects to this. The robots connect to this. It tells the browser when the robots connect and disconnect and reconnect. And you get much better semantics that way. And I use Lua for that because why not? JavaScript, all the things, is fun. But using lots of languages is fun, too. So whatever is fun and productive, don't, don't restrict yourself. So I used some Lua in there. And of course, on the microcontroller, you can run Lua on these. They are barely powerful enough to run embedded Lua. In fact, these chips are called Node MCU. They have something kind of like Lovett, which is a Lua version of Node running on the microcontroller. But it's a little harder for kids to grasp, and it uses all the RAM. Lua is not quite small enough for the hardware. And so I wrote my own VM, because it's fun. I do it all the time. It's a weird habit. And it's pretty simple. So, because it's just an interpreter. It's nothing fancy. 
So first you define all your opcodes. So we've got the do end, which lets you have an arbitrary number of statements and do them as one expression. There's a dump, that's, which prints a number. We got read and write for the pins. We got mode. We got the I squared C stuff. Um, tone, delay. We have a few function call things, go sub, go to, and call. Call actually lets you pass arguments via some stack semantics. Globals, local variables. We can increment, decrement variables, increment with a modulus, which is a really common operation in robotics. And so I made it a keyword. Of course, the forever. Your basic while. Wait is a fun one. It just, it just, it just blocks on a condition until that condition is true. And so in the program for, yeah, I, I didn't show you this program. My demo program for the little, little device is called TriSwitch. And it's not talking to me. Well, anyway, of course it's not. I waited too long. There's still some timeout issues in the demo. All right, maybe it'll talk to me now. There it is. So I don't know if you can see this. So this light is, is throbbing light and dark. And as you press the buttons, it changes color. It, circles, it cycles through the six colors that are the basic combinations of the three lights. And I used wait because hardware buttons have a lot of jitter when you press them. And the hardware can pull them really fast. And so you, you just press the button once, the hardware may get 1,000 presses. And so what you do is, when the button is pressed, do the action, update the light, and then add in 128 millisecond delay, and then wait for the button to be raised, and then delay a little more for more bounce. And this is called software debouncing. All your keyboards, good keyboards have hardware and software debouncing, but this is really essential if you're working with hardware. And we can just implement it here in the, in the language. Yeah, Decker mod, that fun one. And it's a, pretty fun, it's a pretty fun system. So you just implement all the opcodes. And then in the actual interpreter, this is not the most efficient thing, but these devices have way more CPU than memory, and so it's OK. It's just a giant switch on the opcode. I consume however many arguments it needs, and I do some action. And I'm calling through here to the Arduino APIs, digital write, analog read, and so forth. Yeah. Um, there's so much more stuff that I wanted to do, but I ran out of time preparing it and ran out of time presenting it. But I hope this gives you a taste of the many things that are possible if you want to. And hopefully someday this actually helps kids learn to program. I think it's helping Jack, so there's progress. So thank you very much.